this is uh, really the first, I guess, campaign stream because I want to show my process. One of the things that kick, one of the things that Kickstarter was about, is uh, showing sort of the behind the scenes of how I run Dungeons and Dragons. And a question that I get a lot, a lot, a lot, is, uh, "Hey, help me build a. How do I build a pantheon of gods?" And I am, I'm surprised that I get that question because I sort of feel like, well, certainly there have been plenty of pantheons in the real world. Just go, you know, Google how, what, how does that stuff happen? Let me turn down. I can hear the time writer. A little distracting. Um, <clears throat> but since I routinely get that question, I figured, uh, and since it's a big gap right now in my understanding of the upcoming campaign, I figured we'd do a stream on this. Now, I don't, um, I, I'm not sure, there's somebody on the subreddit, slash r slash Matt Colville, that, uh, who asked, how do I get my players engaged in the gods? I mean, that's an overwhelming question, like, how do I get my players to engage with underscore? So it's probably going to be a subject of a future running the game video. And I just asked the question, why should the players engage with the gods? Why should they do that? And the answers I got were like, well, because they're objectively real. And I'm like, well, there are a lot of things that are objectively real that we don't expect the players to engage with. So it's yet again another one of those things that I think we do mostly for us as Dungeon Masters. Certainly some players are interested in that kind of thing. I think generally speaking, in order to achieve a certain degree of verisimilitude, you know, that notion that the world feels like a real place, then we need some gods. Even players who... I mean, regardless of whether the players engage with them or not, we need them so that the world feels like a real place. And the players running a cleric, they need to know what the gods are out there. But one of the things I've noticed is that when typically I would say, I don't know, 90% of the cleric, cleric players that I have engaged with and watched even in person and online making characters, they don't ask about the gods. They just look at the list of domains and pick the one they like. You know, if they want to be, they're either a war cleric or a light cleric or a, you know, a life cleric or a nature or whatever. And the gods then sort of become a, an afterthought. Because it doesn't say in the player's handbook, oh, you want to play a cleric, pick a god. It says pick a domain. Right? They've intentionally decoupled these two things. And probably wisely because it means they don't have to worry about what the pantheon but the setting of the world is they don't know what your setting is but they know these are how the domains work so one of the first things i did i did a little bit of homework very little um i just went through the domains in the player's handbook and tried to get a sense of what they stood for uh amusingly just a little just today one of my players said hey who is the god of light in your setting? And, you know, that betrayed a lot of ignorance regarding how my setting works, for one thing, but also how, like, you know, human beings work. Because that's not, generally speaking, how gods are represented in our own human cultures. They're not generally gods of abstract concepts. That's something I think you tend to only get in fantasy games. They tend to be gods that embody certain human virtues and vices mores and folkways they are they are cultural and so what i did was when he was asking he or she was asking who's the god of light i went to the player's handbook and looked and said what does it say about the light domain and i found that very interesting actually it says the light domain is about birth and you can see it right here i hope if this is working yeah birth and renewal truth vigilance and beauty uh and to the ability to see through deception i as soon as i saw this list birth renewal truth vigilance and beauty i was like well now these are things you can have gods about <laughs> right they used to call this i think in second edition they called this the gods portfolio and i i don't know why there seemed to be a lot of uh, designer distaste at that a lot of people didn't seem to a lot of people who work on the game afterwards didn't like the idea of gods having portfolios. For some reason, maybe the term portfolio seemed to make it uh, feel like a, a CV, like a like you're applying for a job. Here's my here's my portfolio. 
but I thought it was a perfectly useful term, so you can see I used it here. And I just went through it and listed all the domains in the player's handbook, obviously, um, and what they are and what they represent using terms from the description. So knowledge, right? Uh, I like the idea that there is a god of craftsmanship, gods of invention, lore, secrets, and these could be different gods, right? The god of invention might be a very different god than the god of secrets, but they would both use the knowledge domain makes perfect sense to me. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between gods and domains. That's one thing we need to understand is that you can have several gods that share domains and several domains that are shared by several gods. They overlap. And let's see, what else? We have life, which is vitality, health, healing the sick and wounded, caring for those in need, and opposing undeath. Okay, you can see it's a broad category. My camera's, yeah, broad category. Includes a lot of stuff, so it would cover lots of different gods. Light is, we got covered that. And then nature is just, it just says nature. There's no, there's no equivalence in the description. And, and because these domains are not um, systemic, they're not meant to be categorical. They're just a loose collection of ideas. Some of them are abstract concepts. Some of them are, are you know, manifest phenomenon. Um, and they don't, some of them overlap and they're just kind of a mess. But I think it's that way on purpose. So nature just says, nature. And so I have written here, because I need something, right? Love, youth, growth, birth, and death in the sense that everything has a beginning and an end, a natural beginning and an end, right? Uh, then we have tempest, which has, I made two different lines because one of them is just a bunch of natural phenomenon. Storm, sea, sky, lightning, thunder, earthquake. I tend to associate those ideas with like really ancient pre-civilization gods. So I wouldn't expect to see a god of you know, earthquakes uh, in, a, in a medieval European pantheon. And then Tempest is also, we get another, this is all from the Player's Handbook, by the way. Violence, strength, courage, and justice. These are great. So Tempest, I don't find that useful. But violence, strength, courage, and justice, I actually do. And then Trickery has got quite a lot. Uh, notice that Trickery lists, like, the type of people that serve a god like that, thieves and scoundrels and gamblers. And, and then it says liberators, and I made a little comment here, because reading through the trickery domain, I think rebels and liberators, we tend to make a, uh, you know, a positive association with, probably at least here in America, at least here in the West. But I don't think that's what they mean. They mean just purely reversal of fortune, right? Because that's what rebels and liberators are trying to do. They're trying to, whatever state the world is in, they're trying to the world turned upside down. And then we get, so we go from a list of people to cultural mores and folkways and notions like subterfuge, prank, subterfuge, pranks, deception, and theft. Okay, I get that. That makes sense. And then war has a great list. It covers honor and chivalry, but also destruction and pillage and conquest and domination. Fantastic. So we've got a list here of the different uh, domains and their portfolios. And it's my goal as a dungeon master to make sure that after I have satisfied myself and done my own nonsense for me, in other words, developed a pantheon of gods and given, you know, depth and try to give backstory to it and try to represent them realistically in a cultural setting, then I'm going to go back and make sure that the players get what they need because I don't think they came here for the gods. I think they came here to find out who am I, who do I worship if I get... Because all they care about is, where do my abilities come from? What cool special abilities do I get? What spells are in my domain list? That kind of thing. How, do I, how can I use my channel divinity? And so if they're like, okay, uh, what do I put down here on my character sheet for God? They've already chosen light for their domain. They're like, who is that, Matt? And then it's, so regardless of whether or not, this is another thing where I think that um, me as somebody who is, you know, monetizing their free time, that's a luxury I have, I want to make sure that people other than my unique players can find the stuff they're looking for in my setting. You can make a wildly heterodox campaign setting that doesn't have, for instance, gods, doesn't have clerics. But I want to make sure, and this started, this isn't, by the way, something that just started. This is something that's been true for, I would say, eight or nine years. I've been making sure that if you find it in the player's handbook, you're going to be able to find it in my setting, right? And then, so I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm saying I do that because I've been aware for a long time that I could probably take this stuff and try to monetize it one way or another. So I, and, 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 
that is just a means to an end. And the end is a broad category of people can use this content and not be like, well, I can't use this. There's no humans in this setting or whatever. So I always try to make sure that I don't have to then, if a player's gone through the trouble of reading through the player's handbook, good Lord, and chosen a domain and come to me and said, which, which god is this? That I don't then get on my high horse and say, well, actually, you're playing in this one region of my campaign setting, and they don't have that domain. Right? That's... That's, that's not a useful response. Uh, the players need to know that the stuff they find in the player's handbook is going to be in there somewhere. So the game is set in Rioja, in the city of Capital, the greatest city in this or any age. That's propaganda. I'm almost certain there is a greater city somewhere. Um, and Rioja is a sort of uh, it's medieval Italy, it's Rome, it's Venice. Milan, that kind of stuff. And the image I have here, which kind of represents that, is Caravaggio's uh, The Card Sharps, right? So this is what you would see on the streets or in a, in a tavern somewhere in Capital. Um, so what we're gonna do on the stream is we're gonna build the gods of Capital, and then we'll probably throw some more in there because Capital is this hugely cosmopolitan city. So we're gonna need to know what some of the gods, and we may not be able to cover all this in one stream, I've already been talking for 12 minutes, and we haven't made one god yet. But there's a lot more work to do besides this. This is going to be, this is almost certainly going to be more than one stream because there's actually quite a lot of work to do, some of which is self-imposed because of my own nonsense, but then some of which I think we're sort of responsible for anytime we build a setting or a city or, you know, a, a culture. So step one is gods, but then step two, and this is unique to me, is the people in my setting don't worship gods. They worship saints. And there's, there's levels of abstraction. These are still, gods are still people. I mean, they're humanoid. Zeus, Apollo, that kind of thing. But then you have um, hero, famous living people who were granted sainthood. And they're not called saints everywhere. The people in my anal Viking analog don't call them saints. They call them heroes. Uh, but they still venerate them and they still, they still worship them. Uh, so I've got to come up with not only who the gods are, but who the saints are. And every god has several saints. But we're not, we're not necessarily going to go through the whole list. Because what we're mostly worried about, and this is now the third layer of abstraction, is churches and churches are organizations so you can have you know there, there could be dozens of saints because some of these cultures have been around for thousands of years there could be dozens of saints but 80 to 90 percent of them are obscure and only a couple have churches and of those only a couple probably there's one big dominant one if you've read my novels you know that for instance um the patron god of the place that the book takes place in is caval this is important for actually the stream standby. And his his number one saint is Llewellyn and the Church of St. Llewellyn the Valiant. And that's something I like. I like the idea that, um, and this we're not going to get too far into the weeds on this. Uh, we're going to imply stuff and then leave it alone. The idea being that there's a Church of St. Llewellyn the Valiant, but there's probably also other churches to, I don't mean buildings, I mean organizations, other churches to St. Llewellyn that represent other parts of his portfolio. Uh, so... And that, to me, is realistic. It's factionalism, which we get in the real world. It's the idea that different, uh, different prophets have competing ideas for what this saint wants. And the saints enjoy kind of playing these guys off each other. So saints are more human. You're more, much more likely to encounter a saint uh, if you're like, something goes wrong and you're a good cleric. I mean, I don't mean good as in alignment-wise. I mean, you have, you have been pious and you've converted some people and maybe you desecrated some bad guy temples and you built... Maybe you built a church, fantastic. Your saint may actually come and help you out. I think that's, uh, in fact, isn't there, a, isn't there an ability or a spell, a class ability where you can petition your god and they will, they will grant you aid? Well, in a situation like that, I would expect your saint to actually show up and, and help manifestly. So we're gonna build some gods, we're gonna build some saints, and in order for me to figure out uh, how that's gonna work, I need to do a little bit of thought because Rioja, is this is a specific instantiation of a strategy that I suggest you use, and that is thinking about the cultural history of your world. These gods do not exist in a vacuum. If you're just sitting there going, oh, I'll create a god. I mean, you could do that if you want. I'll create a god of fire. I'll create a god. I don't think most cultures, I think the Aztecs had like a god of fire, but I think, you know, like um, for the Greeks, it would be Hephaestus. It would be the god of the forge, right? Not a, not a god of this abstract concept. So I tend to think in terms of the culture and the history. And since this is my campaign and in my stream, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, the Riojans, along with the rest of the world, were conquered by the Kalian Empire. Um, 
like 3,000 years ago, and the Kalian Empire collapsed like 500 years ago. So for quite a long time, there was this Roman Empire analog that came out of the Commonwealth. And so not all of the gods of all the cultures, but certainly the gods of like uh, Rioja and Vasloria, which is the place all my campaign stuff has happened up and down my novels, they uh, sort of adopted these foreign gods, but they gave them their own names. And as soon as you do that, of course, you know, the, the Kaelian Empire is perfectly happy for you to worship, you know, whatever, as long as they're, you call it what you want, as long as it's not subversive, right? Uh, but of course, once you have that uh, notion that we're going to give them our own names, now they start to be, now that they're separate, they're no longer equal. So there's always going to be some differences between one pantheon and another, even though they're coming off the same template. So actually, I guess I could do this in Excel. Um, there's a April RPG thing going around. And uh, one of the things is what is your, what are your favorite design tools? And I find that as a designer, I am typically, um, the first thing I do is I don't open Microsoft Word as a designer. I open Excel. <laughs> I open Excel or I open, in some rare cases, I open um, FileMaker Pro. Uh, no, don't, don't discard that. I want to come back here and let's just add a table here. So I've got, uh, I don't even actually know what the OG Kalian gods are. I've never bothered to figure that out, and this campaign isn't set there. But I know what their Vasilorian counterparts are. So I'm just going to list those. And then that's going to be the beginning of our template. So this is kind of cheating, I guess, because... But you'll see how we, over once we get to Saints and stuff like that. Uh, it's filling in this third column. That's where we're going to start to get the distinct culture of Rioja. Because in Vasloria, we've got a dune. Actually, let's put um, portfolio. As long as we come, I will consider this a successful stream if I come out the end of this and I've built a pantheon that I'm happy with. How useful it is to you, I, I cannot say. Uh, but if it, if it produces a pantheon I'm happy with, then it'll be all right. And some of the things we've already talked about are going to be more useful than you might guess at first. So here we have a dune is the god a dune is the god of uh, goodness. Did I put three? Goodness, strength, and truth. Now, I can tell you that a dune, this is a particular cultural phenomenon in Vasloria, a dune believes that uh, uh, strength is virtuous. Right? That there's a relationship between strength and truth. I don't think Rioans believe that. Uh, so we have a dune, and let's, we're, there's a whole bunch of gods, but I'm not going to go through them all first. I'm going to pick just a couple, and then Caval. And Caval is the god of justice. What else? Uh, law. And specifically, civil law. The idea that men should be, men should rule men, not God shouldn't rule men. Um, just punishment. That may, go, that may be... So we can imagine that in the Kalian Empire, our, our Roman analog, they had some gods that corresponded to these things roughly. The thing about Adun and Caval is they are brothers. Um, and where these gods originate from is, is something that I have vague ideas about, but we're not going to get into. Were they real people? Probably, but that's, that sentence I just spoke is the most I've ever thought about it. So the Riohan version of Adun and Caval would be related to each other, but they probably wouldn't be brothers because I think Rioja being, um, you know, this this more Mediterranean culture, more flam more Mediterranean, more flamboyant, much more ob obsessed with theater and drama and dueling, um, that kind of stuff. I think that they would either, they'd probably still be related to each other, but not brothers. So maybe husband and wife, maybe a male and a female god, maybe lovers. Um, and I think I like the idea. I think that their uh, Riohans are probably, um, they're traditional. How do they feel about marriage? I don't know. But I think they would probably be, for now, I'm going to just decide that the two chief gods, let's say, because Adun and Cabal are certainly these chief gods and all the other ones they are around, but they're not as important, um, are mm, husband and wife, married. So... 
and the idea here being that the people are ruled by a king and a queen and that that has some kind of, you know, that that is to a certain extent Riohans, traditional Riohans believe that that's somehow good or right or proper. Uh, something probably observed more in the breach than in the, you get it. Um, there's a huge difference between the traditions that we came from and the way people, especially in a metropolitan place like capital. Uh, so here, how they'd be, you know, a man and a woman and they wouldn't be named Adun and Kaval. They would probably be, have names that are appropriate. And this is a big part of how I do a lot of stuff is where the names come from. And because Caravaggio is a artist that I quite like and I think his work is highly emblematic of this place, I'm literally going to mine this dude's backstory for appropriate names. And I, 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 you know, I sort of wonder, I like that notion of the passage of time. So somebody like Michelangelo, that's the guy's first name. We're not going to use that. Um, obviously, the English version of that is Michael. But we might have a saint that is Saint Michelangelo. We probably won't because of the, the cult, our cultural baggage there. But that's a modern Riohan name, is my point. And that saints are all, saints, by definition, well, with some exceptions, are all newer than the gods. So the gods would have older names, right? Um, so, for instance, Adun and Kaval. Kaval is, a, is a, a, a name I got from an actual literary source. But the saint is Saint Llewellyn, Saint Godwin, right? And these are, these are more, in Vasloya, those are more modern names. So what is an, um, you know, a medieval Italian name look like? I have no idea. Um, let me type in early medieval, early medieval Italian. I figure like when I got the name, I'm 80% of the way there because everything else, working on names is a lot of research and work and then inventing the stuff is a lot easier. I don't want 14th century Venetian personal names. Uh, what do we get here? Um, See, this doesn't, this isn't good because I don't feel like I'm getting a good sense of how old these names are. I like it when I can see, oh, these are from a book from the 11th century, for instance. Um, let's see if we can, 14th century, late medieval, I don't want late medieval, I want early medieval. Um, Dutch, Flemish, medieval, Italian names. Rare names given in early Italian records. This sounds useful. This is my process. Maybe you like it and you find it useful. Maybe you don't. But uh, it is nothing else if not mine. So I'm just looking. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Huh. This is, a I'm already happy with this process because um, some of these names were unusual even centuries ago. I haven't even read the article. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I may go, well, what's, and I may start, start reading it as I have questions about it. But I'm just going to go to the name. I just want the names. And all they have to do is satisfy me. They don't have to satisfy the author of the article. The author of the article is not going to be playing my D&D game. Fabio, we're not going to have a god called Fabio. That's, that's ridiculous. Stop suggesting things like that. Um, in practice, most Italians were named for saints or classical figures. This is an interesting reversal, right? Where now I'm, I'm going to name some gods after Italian people who were named after Italian saints and gods. Um, stand by. So... Castrense, Calcedonio, Baldessere, Cipriano, Cipriano, I like that. Uh, Egidio, 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 are religious examples are particularly prevalent in localities where these saints are venerated. Dario, Achille, Achille, I mean, we know where that comes. Eusebio, 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 Fabio, I'm not Italian, I'm doing the best I can. A classical names, of course, a large number of classical names. Uh, Silvio, etc., which trace their origins to the pagan. Okay, uh huh. Uh, Cruciano, Imperio, Pompeo, Pompeo. This is now we're starting to get into like our early Roman stuff, which is a different area of my world. So I don't want to kind of, I don't, that, that's appropriate because they're, they, they're right next to each other and they have one conquered the other a long time ago. Um, It's funny because, you know, as a, there's a lot of my setting stuff you can start reading up because I'm borrowing it from real human history. And there's a lot of that in here. I just want to, for one second, check chat here.
Oops, excuse me. Whoa, this article is a lot longer than I thought. Um, no. Hmm, a feminine or Astrina. Saint names automatically based on virtues are not too unusual today. But in older records, we find goddess, strength, virgin, as well as I don't is Rioja the kind of place that would venerate uh, virginity? There's nothing wrong with that, I don't think, as far as world building goes. Uh, the, I think that's more of a Vaslorian weirdness than it would be a Riojan weirdness. Um, <clears throat> Toro derives not from bull. So I don't think they would. In fact, I think almost the opposite. I think these are a much more kind of, um, you know, I don't want to say healthy, but uh, I think of that Romeo and Juliet thing where they, you know, it's the Middle Ages and they fall in love and they're like, I don't know, 13 or 15 or whatever. Um, translation of Latin names. Christian name. This is actually a, pretty, a really well-researched article. I don't know if it's going to be incredibly useful for us, but I think it will be. Um, so, I think Baldessari is a good name. Let's drop that in here. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look that up and see, like, what am I going to find out about that? It's a male name. That's fine. And uh, there's a famous dude, Count of Casaccio, Casatico, Casa, Ca, Casatico. Italian courtier, diplomat, soldier. Yeah, I'm down with that. It seems like there's only this one famous dude. I just assume that's who I meant when I typed him in. Um, so this, one of the things I like about this is that there, Baldessari is the male god, and I don't know who the female god is yet, but because they're married, and I think I think what I'm assuming about the Rio and Pantheon, this is not true of the Vaslorian Pantheon. The Vaslorian Pantheon is more like a family. I think the Riohan Pantheon is more like a royal house. So they're still related to each other, but they probably have titles and stuff like that. So this would be like Lord, Lord Baldessari. That's what they would call him, right? Not because he is a god, oh my lord, not be, but because he is a noble. He's a nobleman, right? So his wife is going to be Lady something. I don't know what. We're going to find out. We've already made one god. And we don't get, get, we, don't, we only have his name. We don't know what his kind of thing is. Um, except I can kind of tell you out of the gate. It's going to be, uh, I'm already starting, let's see, his portfolio. is probably going to be nobility. Because he's the, he's the chief of the Rio and gods, one of them. And he is, um, he's, uh, he is a, he is noble. He is a lord. So now I need a good, uh, a good girl name. It's a sexist way of putting it, but. Uh, I need to search for. See these names, Antonella, Katerina, these are two, these aren't old enough. I need something that's going to sound to me, at least to me, like even Baldessari is a. I feel like we're not going back far enough. These are unusual even in the 1500s. Hmm. Ooh, look at these names. I like this. We got some good names right here. Bali, Zali. Oh, yeah. Manto. Manto. We got to have a god called Manto, probably from Matteo. That's me, Matthew. Uh. I actually like both of these names. Lady Farella. We all right with that? I reserve the right to change these as I live with them. It's not unusual for me to end up with a list of names, and some of them are better than others. And when I'm making the list, because I feel like I need to get the list done, I go, well, okay, that'll do. But then over time, I kind of, the ones that aren't that good, they kind of, and I want to scratch that and fix it. But step one, get the list done. Step two, 
once I see the list is done and I see that there are some names that I like better than others, the issue then becomes, why do I like those names? And why don't I like these? And if I can identify the reason why, then I, it might just be, you know, the what's the word, euphony, uh, that they're just pretty or they sound good. So then I might even make up a name. I might even invent a name when everything else is a historical reference of one sort or another. I might invent a name just because I want, I can do that. I can invent it and make it sound like the names that I like. So Lady uh, Fiorella, Fiorella, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm not sure how I feel about either of these, by the way. I might throw them all out. Uh, Mercurio, eh. Donisa? Do I like Donisa better? I think I like Donisa better. Completely arbitrary. Fuck off. I'm not sure what her portfolio is. She's uh, the queen. So one of the... And, uh, but I haven't really even started worrying worry about that at all. But notice that it's justice, law, just punishment. Um, so we're going to find a way to take these ideas and maybe making them more broad apply them to the lord and the lady um and in fact like lord and lady might be a uh might be a uh, exclamation people make invoking invoking the chiefs of the gods so i'm just gonna stop for now and uh, it's already 32 minutes. I don't intend on going for two hours. We might only go, for, I mean, I don't intend on going for more than two hours. We might only go for an hour and stop, um, which may not be satisfying, I realize. But only because we're gonna do some work, spend a week thinking about it, and spend next Saturday doing some more work. So we have Adun and Caval. We also have Malus, Malus, Salorna, Virus. Service and Nikros. And I think we're going to work on service. Wait, where'd you go? Service, Nikros. So service and Nikros. Uh, uh -huh, hate <laughs> is another name of it. Um, the god of men who believe they've been wronged by life and seek revenge. So hate, vengeance. That's not vengeance, right? Probably not. Uh, he's the god of the deformed and lame. He's a... Uh, and subverting, subverting fate. So I'm not super worried about this column yet because I'm going to spend some time thinking about, you know, what are the Riohan virtues? But certainly fortune is one of them. In fact, um, you know, there's almost certainly a, a god or goddess of fortune. And it might be you know, a god that has a masculine and feminine representation. One god um, that has multiple, that presents in multiple ways. But Servus and Nikros, much like Adun and Caval, Servus and Nikros are brothers. And in fact, there's a phrase in my, in my setting, if you see, uh, if you read novels, people often say, black gods. They are specifically referring to these two. They are the, they are the black gods because they're the evil ones. They're also called the, the black brothers. And Nikros is strength and dominance. In other words, it's the idea that might makes right, that strength is the same as... So notice that Adun thinks that a strong person tends to be honest. And in fact, in Vasloria, there's the test of strength that farmers, people in villages will still use, where if there's a dispute and there's no local magistrate, they'll just have these two guys do some crazy feat of strength, like build, literally build a wall. And the first person to pass out was was wrong uh was lying because that's how they they because they believe that uh strength and truth are are the same but this guy is kind of the flip side of that which is it's might makes right and if i should i should rule because i am strong strength dominance uh the right of the strong to rule over the weak he is the tyrant he's the god of tyrants um so it would be nice to figure out who these gods were. Uh, let's see. What do we got? Let's. Do we get any other good names? Medi medieval Italian names, 1427. Medieval Venetian names. Ooh, 1150. This is Dutch and Flemish. That's kind of annoying. Although, some of these look pretty good. Wow, this is a very, this is a very tiny text. 
This website uses cookies. Oh, go to hell. Alto. Yeah, these are not bad. Some of these are not bad. These are boy names. Do we have girl names? Yeah. So you can see that some of these are like shorter and simpler. So I, it doesn't really bother me. Like I'm, I'm not going to pick names that don't sound suitably Italian to me. Like um, I think Alta was on here somewhere. That sounds good. Uh, let's see what else we got in the in the Googles. Ah, mein Googles! Uh, Italy in the Middle Ages. No, thank you. Late period. Why is always it's early medieval? How about that? Is that no, is that not a phrase? Oops. <laughs> the second hit is Ireland. Okay, well, fail. Um, maybe I'm just looking up <laughs> thousands of medieval names for your dog. Okay, all right. Dog, comma, or pet. So this may just be a bust. It may be that I've got to kind of do my own uh, invention slash research. I can see people in chat are saying, well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And that would be their way of doing it. And that would not be what the thing I'm, I've, I've promised you folks is. And that is the way I do it, whether you like it or not. Uh, this would really be the process. So, except I wouldn't be talking about it as much. And that would probably actually result in something different happening. Um, I still like this page. So, what did, when do we get here? Uh, if I remove early, I might just... The SCA. Some of these, some of these sites I've been to before, and they're notoriously okay. Well, this is good. See, I, I removed the thing, and because some of these are, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Italian names from 1312. That's good. Do we get anything from like the 1100s? Uh, 14th century, 15th century, 13 to 16, 15. Jewish names in Milan. That could be. Oh, I get it. No, well, I, that would be useful. Names from 16th, late period, personal names, 17th century. No, um, 13th century. Here we go. Masculine and feminine names from the 13th century. Wow. Yeah. Let's see what we get here. It's pretty useful. Male names given by frequency. Oh, okay. I don't care. The order doesn't matter to me. Guido. Huh. You can see a lot of these are Latinate. Uh, there's probably some kind of like... That's the nature of the beast, though. The so I may just put uh, names on hold for a second. Not not because I don't think this is particularly fruitful, but because I've gone down a road and I've gotten a bunch of different options, some of which are more useful to me than others. But I'm kind of getting a little burned out of just looking at names. So I'm just going to switch and start talking about what is, what are the uh, mores and folkways. Of, so let's see. This is um, uh, gods and saints of Rioja, and let's see. Put in. Let's see, give that a header, and then. Rio and culture, and then what do I know about what do I know or what do I want to decide is true about Rio and culture? What do they, what do they venerate? Um, they certainly venerate um, nobility. Um, only recently, in the last thirty years, have merchants and working now. As soon as I'm writing this. Uh, only recently, that trade, that's an important note, because there's probably, Rioans probably have, they're the greatest uh, sailors in the age. They probably have some notion of venerating trading, whether it's a god or a saint, we're going to find out. Only recently, in the last 30 years, have merchants and mercantile um, guilds risen to prominence. 
I'm not sure if that's grammatically correct, but we'll fix that later. I can't type while people are watching me. Is that right? Is that right? Is that a word? Only recently, the last 30 years, have merchants and mercantile guilds risen to prominence. For the last, I don't know, 1500 years, Rioja has been ah, a feudal society. Thank you, autocorrect. I think it's just because the text is tiny. Riojans obsess over nobility. It's different than Vaslorians. Vaslorians believe in knights and lords and ladies and stuff like that, but they they don't they don't put them on a pedestal the way uh, Riojans do. Uh, Average citizens, especially in capital, uh, draw long lists. You don't really draw a list, but I like the phrasing of that. Draw long lists. Genealogical. Uh, long, long lists uh, tracing their bloodline back to ancient, obscure, and sometimes fictional nobility. It's a very rough draft. Uh, so in other words, what we're, what we're doing is uh, Rioja capital specifically is experiencing tension. The central tension is between the nobility and the guilds. Right? That's new. So how's it been before that? Well, they, they're, you know, they pride themselves on, I'm actually the fifth son twice removed of this. Yeah, I'm a dirt farmer now, but, right? So that's, uh, that's a big deal to them. And they emulate, they like to emulate nobility, right? What the nobility does, that, that's not, Vasilorians don't do that. Uh, they don't care what the king does. <laughs> uh, they have a much more practical attitude toward feudalism, I think, than, uh, than Rioja does. So again, we've got a god over here, don't forget. We've got uh, Lord Baldessere who is the, a, god, a god of nobility. Um, 643. We'll go for at least... We're not going to stop at 7, but we might stop at 7.30. Real ones obsess over nobility. Average citizens, especially in... Especially, I used to say especially until a, a girl I was dating uh, uh, metaphorically beat that out of me. Draw, they draw long lists tracing their bloodline back to ancient, obscure, and sometimes fictional nobility. That's a very Matt Colville phrase. <laughs> ancient, obscure, and sometimes fictional. Um... Right. So they uh, they follow the trends set by their noble lords, <coughs> and they don't really believe in the divine right of kings, but they do have kind of a low-level background assumption that the nobles are just better. Vazorians don't, and the Kalians didn't. They aspire. Uh, ah, here we go. Fortune. Unlike Vazloria, uh, well, no, I guess that's they're pretty similar. Uh, well, uh, so I'm doing a lot of this. I'm defining a lot of this pantheon and this culture in terms of contrasts. I know how it is over here in the medieval England sort of analog. How is it over here? Well, uh, Vazlorians assume kings and queens and their line will be stable and maintained over a few generations. Over at least a few generations. But Rioans are all too familiar with the uh, word I'm looking for is like vagaries of fate. I don't know if that's a real word, Sam. I. Aha. Unexpected, inexplicable change. Yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, of fate and fortune. They expect 
nobles to be poisoned, betrayed, and the lists to be rewritten several times in any given generation. That's a lot of editing. A lot of this is going to have to get tightened up. Um, so people watching are probably like, what does this have to do with gods? Well, I don't know yet. We'll find out. This is going to be some of this, you know. The, the relationship, again, the relation for me, the relationship between culture and gods is, inextric you can't extract, they're, they're mixed up together. So in order to find out about one, we got to learn about the other. Uh, let's, let's, know, let's add this to the dictionary so we don't, let's add this to the dictionary. And let's add that to the dictionary. Actually, kind of surprised these aren't in here. Um, so let's give this a header since we're talking about nobility. So, probably be a god there. Fate and fortune. Uh, fortune, the wheel of fortune, not the game show. Uh, the notion that whoever is up will soon be down, and vice versa, plays a major part in the lives of your average Rio, in the lives of your average Rio. Uh, they believe, they don't, they do not believe this is mere chance. They believe the gods, they believe the gods, I want to write that, they believe the gods like turnover, but <laughs> it might be totally not, um, it's okay to laugh sometimes, but that's not exactly where I want that laugh to happen. Uh, that's not where I want that gag to land, is maybe a better way. They do not believe this is mere chance. They believe the gods act to bring down the mighty and raise up the meek. Um, and they do. I want to point out, that's not just their opinion. This really happens. Uh... That's a subject-verb agreement, obviously, because what's happening in that sentence is different than what's happening in the next sentence. But who dares wins? And we'll, like I said, we'll come back to this and edit it heavily. Um, so I just want to think about that. Fate and fortune. Oh, gambling. Yeah. Um, we always like to gamble. They consider it a sort of virtue. Or where... They're aware that uh, some people can't, some people overdo it. So they know that there's like gambling addiction, basically. Uh, these are, I said, in my head I said are, but my, my fingers typed our. Obviously my fingers heard one thing and I, I think I feel like this day deserves its own heading, even though it's going to be. And this relates to um, this relates to them. Uh, how do I scroll? Here we go. Here. So not unusually, I will stop. I, I will sometimes. It's a terrible habit I've got into, where um, I'll be writing tap 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 tap, and I'm not even at the end of the sentence. And I go, and I go, and I got a whole write, and then I and I just continue writing, and I never go back to that, and I'll submit something, and somebody will say, "Did you mean to finish this?" And I'll be like, "Eep." Um, so this has a lot to do with the Riohan tradition of sailing to distant lands seeking wealth and fortune through trade through trade when possible, theft when difficult. Uh, theft, th theft through trade when possible, theft when necessary. Here we go. They're pirates, they're traders, but they're also pirates. Uh, the unknown, the 
risk, bold, R-I-S-K, is virtuous. Actually, let me remove the unknown. The risk is virtuous. Uh, the gods reward, bold, those who take bold risks. Quote, fortune favors the bold is a popular saying throughout the world, which is called Orton. It comes from Rioja. I like that notion. I always do this. Like uh, the god of the elves is named Val. And then I just decided that that's where valiant and valorous comes from. There are, the, the, in my setting, those words come from that god. So the, a real phrase in our world, fortune favors the bold, I say it's in, it's in, they have that in my setting as well, and it's specifically it comes from Rioja. So I feel like we've learned a lot um, about the Riojans so far. We know that they uh, venerate, no, they venerate nobility. They, it's, it's this aspirational thing. In fact, did I write that? Let me see. Um, Um, getting a lot of communication from the artist working on the dragons. Nobility is aspirational to the Riojans. Riojans believe uh, that normal people can become that. Uh, uh, Riojans believe anyone. Through luck, chance, treachery, or um, patience <laughs> can. It's funny, I can look at. I got OBS over here. Uh, no, and though they don't, though and though they don't talk about it or think about it, though they don't talk about it, they assume this is like a sub, a culturally subconscious thing that sooner or later everyone gets their shot. Uh, Again, we're doing a lot of, I, I'm contrasting them with the Vazlorians because that's the part of the world I know the best. It's where I've set, set many but not all of my campaigns. We could do this whole thing for all these different cultures in my world. Um, nobility is aspirational to the Rioans. Rioans believe anyone through luck, chance, treachery, or patience can become noble. And though they don't talk about it, they assume that sooner or later, everybody gets their shot at it. Vazlorians believe every man has his place, but Rioans actually have this um, notion, have this uh, arcane, arcane, um, perverse, perverted, uh, uh, wealth? How do they feel about wealth? Mm, I don't know. Because I know that the guilds are looked down on by a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of like the noblemen. Being, be, belonging to a guild is seen as being like um, too practical and too pragmatic for a lot of Rioans. It's, it's too workmanlike. Um, that's an obscure idea. So I have no idea if this is entertaining or not. I'm not actually trying to be entertaining. I'm trying to, trying to capture my thought process. That's the best we can do. Is if the stream accurately captures how Matt Colville thinks. I don't know. I know a lot of people out there that don't care how Matt Colville thinks, and I am I am often one of those people. <laughs> but uh, so it's also my writing process. It's a lot of nonsense. But this is the real campaign prep. You will see this stuff reflected in the campaign. Nobility is aspirational to Rohans. Uh, Rohans actually believe in upward mobility. In a way, Vazlorians don't. Like, they don't, Vazlorians don't believe that uh, in Vazloria, the only way a peasant can become a king is to raise an army. <laughs> and indeed, this is uh, how nobles change. In 
war. War. Uh, for the noble list, I think I've said this anywhere, uh, often being. Uh, let's see. So, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in Rioja, and this is also true of capital, they're, they're basically synonymous. Uh, you, you think, I want to be one of those guys, and I will be one of those guys if I, if I play my cards right. Uh, playing your cards right is a common phrase. And one that betrays the Riohan relationship between gambling, fate, and prosperity. The gods will reward you for winning the game. Now, do Riohans, you know, you know what we're going to do? I don't think they have a notion of fair play. I think they have the opposite. Now, uh, it's important to understand that having a god of treachery does not necessarily mean that they believe that treachery is good. In fact, often the eye, like, you know, um, they don't, um, like, Vazlorians don't have a trickster god. The way the um, the north the north guys do, but these guys might I don't know, but they are treachery is uh, something that they are aware of. It features in all of their plays and their operas, uh, betrayal and reversal. It's the kind of the flip side of fortune. It's not something that they um, aspire to. They don't they don't want to be treacherous. They're just a way that they're just aware that treachery is a fact of life and it's a big part of their culture. So the fact that it's a big part of their culture is not the same as we think it's good, right? That's the, which is good for us because it means we can have a longer list of stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely not like um, I think a, a, a Riohan troubadour or pirate or playwright would think that a Vaslorian knight would be a great character but be a very weird person because they would think of chivalry as being sort of naive right and that the the world doesn't the world they think the world doesn't work the way uh Vaslorians do so uh we have fate and fortune the wheel of fortune the notion of whoever's up will soon be down and vice versa plays a major part in the lives of your average real and they do not believe this is mere chance they believe the gods act to bring down the mighty and raise up the meek and the gods are happy to oblige. There we go. Hang on a minute. And the gods are happy to oblige. Rioans like to gamble. They consider it a sort of virtue. They are aware that... Um, uh, stand by. The common deck of cards bound across Gordon comes from Rioa. And originally was an oracular device. Does that sound familiar? It may seem strange. It may seem strange that I just steal, I just rob all this stuff from the real world. My friend Ken Height would say, Matt, why don't you just run a campaign set in the real world? Um, but I like picking and choosing and deciding where, to, where, the, where the sliders on the graphic equalizer are, right? And that the difference between my version of medieval Italy and the real one is, you know, it's up to me. Uh, so, all right, we wrote a lot about nobility. We're talking here about fate and fortune, although the fate and fortune section is kind of anemic compared to the nobility section, unless we assume that it, it does, this is a level four header. Um, uh, Riohans. Hope the gods of fortune are watching, are watching them, but they know the gods are fickle, but they, uh, 
They would not. But unless desperate. I don't know who the gods of fate and I would go back through this document and stick the names of the gods in once we figured out what they are. But hopefully you can see how what we're writing is not only a description of this culture, but we're also talking about gods, right? Um, they would never invoke the names of the gods of fortune for fear of abusing the privilege. Uh, trying to think of what else can I think of that would be true of these guys uh, let's see didn't we already write about I guess gambling I got because like this stuff is, is more about fate and fortune than is about gambling this has a lot to do with the Rio and tradition of sailing to distant lands seeking wealth and fortune through trade when possible theft when necessary the, the risk is virtuous actually let me just let me just I knew what I meant when I wrote that, but now that I'm reading it, I think, uh, let's just, risk is virtuous. The gods reward those who take bold chances. It's not. Fortune favors the bold. It's a popular saying throughout order when it comes from Rioja. Um, a Riohan hates a sure thing. Doesn't trust it. Many plays operas revolve around protagonists who deliberately stack the deck against themselves to to curry favor with the gods of fortune uh, this is something I while I was writing this in the back of my head, just now, in the back of my head, was a Terry Pratchett book, The Second in the Night Watch. So, the, uh, so it's not um, Guards, Guards. And it's not Feet of Clay. Maybe it is Guards, Guards. The one with the dragon. And there's a, there's a, I have this whole sub, sub, subplot where they're like, you know, the odds are a million to one, but it just might work. And they're like, that means it's going to work. It means it's a sure thing. Because... The gods wouldn't let it happen. You, and it, whenever somebody says, the odds are a million to one, but it just might work, that's how you know it's going to happen because the characters are thinking dramatically and they expect the gods to do the same thing. And so there's a point where they're trying, they're, they're trying to kill Smog from The Hobbit and they know that you need, a, you need, to, you need to shoot an arrow into the... Every dragon has one vulnerable spot. They don't call it that. They call it the vulnerable spot. You've got to hit him in his vulnerables and that every dragon's got one. And so when the dragon flies overhead, that's when you shoot your arrow at it. And the guy's like, well, I got a lucky arrow. Uh, and as they're sitting there thinking about it, you're like, well, the dragon's going to come in, like, really low. Really. And they're huge. These things are massive. So, like, that, that spot could be big. It might actually be really easy to hit this thing. Now that we think about it, maybe the odds aren't a million to one. Maybe they're only 50 to one. And the next time you come back... You think guys like he's standing on one head and he's got a mirror on one hand on one foot he's standing on one leg he's got a mirror and he's trying to shoot he goes all right now we we figure they've done some, they've done the math we figure that the odds of somebody shooting a dragon in the vulnerable spot stand, you know from behind standing on one leg with you know one with an eye patch over one eye are exactly a million a million to one so that was in the back of my head the idea that uh, that these flamboyant swashbuckling characters if they see something is almost certainly going to work they're like this is that's when it's going to fail right that's and i think well, our culture has you know ideas like that uh so so i can imagine that there is not only a god of uh fortune but there might be a saint of gambling right makes sense i've been talking for an hour so far and although i don't think we're really anywhere near the end i think we have made good progress um if i wasn't talking about this and explaining it this probably would have only taken me half an hour like 20 minutes or half an hour to write <laughs> but talking my way through it and explaining explaining my work takes time so um oh, it's treachery part of fail let's let's we have trade we have i'm just going to write down wealth even though that seems like a weird thing but it's kind of in the back of my head so what are uh, other virtues of certainly like um i would say Art. Art is a huge one. 
I just made it a level one header. It's so it's so big. It's um. Uh, art. Art. I want to say something about art, like um. Uh, so the, the, these guys don't have any such notes. They're like, like um, uh, Rothko would not be a would not be one of these guys. Like they like they think that the world should be that the purpose of art is to uh, what is what do they think the purpose of art is? Well, this is a good question. Let's figure it out. Definitely, they would have a god of art. Um, would they have a god of craftsmanship? I'm not sure. Maybe they're the same, right? How like you know a craftsman is an is, a, is an artist from their point of view. Definitely, like the Riohans, like a blacksmith is a blacksmith first and an artist second. But the Riohans might flip it around. Um, so, what do they think uh, the art is to hold a mirror? Yeah, I think that I think they do believe that. Uh, there was a great quote from Simon Shama, in I should go find it because I want to use it as a clip. I reference it so much where he says that Americans believe that art, that great art, leads to democracy. And uh, I think he's basically right. Uh, the notion that we, the, we are taught as children, and I'm bringing this up because I think it's a huge contrast with Rio Owens. We are taught as children that art is this thing you go see in museums and it's educational. That's its purpose, it should be. It's not expressive. In fact, we think of artists who are just drawing because like, that's weird. Why, like, you know, go get a real job. Uh, a real one would never say that to an artist in a million years. Although the down on their luck artist is a kind of, would, is a, again, the thing of fortune of just wait, your, your time will come, man. Um, the notion that Americans have this idea that like art should be virtuous. It should make a, going to the museum makes us a better person. We definitely believe that. You know, it's adults who do it. It's often an assignment. And in fact, I listened to a whole thing on NPR about uh, it was like one of the museums in Chicago is like this is tricky because all our customers are old, and they mostly come because they feel they have a sense of obligation to, and we're running out of money. They don't come because they like coming. They come because it feels like it makes them better people. It's an assignment. That's not true in Rioja. Definitely not true in Rioja. So if Americans believe that art is virtuous, what is the greatest virtue in America? Democracy, <laughs> right? So that's that's he's, it's it's a joke. I thought it was funny when he said it, it made me laugh, but it also made me think, and I think he's right. So, but Rioans don't have that notion. Rioans don't associate art with like commerce. They don't think they don't they, the notion of talking about movies making money would be weird to them. They art costs money. <laughs> it doesn't make money. Art is art is something you do with money. <laughs> I've got money. Let's make some art. Uh, the notion of creating, like art is a means to, art, there we go, it took a long time to get there, art is an end unto itself. Uh, pursuing it is a noble virtue. I just wrote that, I didn't think about what it means, but that means that uh, the, the noble class Expected to be arts, and often are not. Um, art is an end unto itself. Pursuing it is a noble virtue. Uh, this is where patronage goes. In fact, now this is so long. The noble class, there's not a parenthetical anymore. This is where patronage comes from. If you were a noble. You better either be a great artist or the sponsor of great artists. You can imagine that these headers are, there's a god for these things. There's a god of nobility, there's a god of fate and, fate and fortune, there's probably a saint of gambling. Um, so we talked about, there's probably a god of treachery. We talked about how they're the best sailors in the world. And we talk about how they take long, they like taking long chances, but also part of that means they like travel. So they're probably a god, that, or at least, uh, if not a god, maybe a saint that represents travel. Uh, this is where patronage comes from. If you're a noble, you better either be a great artist or the sponsor of great artists. Um, Riohans assume this is also very medieval Christian theology. Uh, Riohans assume that a great artist 
is someone blessed by the gods. If you've ever heard the term humanist, that comes from the idea of people saying, actually, I think I'm a great artist because I busted my ass at it. Thank you very much. And I went to school and apprenticed and until my fingers bled. And, and I have some insight that's probably a result of my parents and upbringing. It's not because God just gave me this gift. Get away with you with that. I deserve some of the credit for having made this beautiful thing. <laughs> right? Uh, certainly people in medieval Europe would have thought that was um, blasphemous. Uh, but the Rioans would agree. The Rioans would, because they live in a world where there really are gods. <laughs> Excuse me, I am recovering from Pax East con crud. Never got, it's, no, it's not bad, it's just wearing. Rioans assume that a great artist is someone blessed by the gods. I don't know if I'm going to say anything else about that. I don't know what else there is to say. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and actually, um, there they have uh, a successful artist is one who makes great art, not one who makes money. In fact, I think wealth is definitely not. Money is considered, that's what I'm looking for. I know what the word I'm looking for is, it's French. And I want to put the actual, even though there's no, there's no France in my setting. Whoa. Oop. I think, uh, I think I said this, but I'm going to put it in here. Art costs money. It doesn't make money. You put money in, you get art out. Artists uh, are dramatically, meaning in, dra in drama, not uh, expected to die penniless. An artist who died wealthy would be considered failure because he abandoned and pursued commerce that that is a dirty word to Rio Owens or at least it has been up until the last little while and I think what we we're seeing is a, a waning of the nobility and a waxing Growth. There's a weapon. Uh, I think it's one of the best weapons in the game. In an RPG, I was a writer for for VR called the Well, and it's the Sword of Waxing. And I like that because I think that has this ancient terminology to it and this echo in our culture. And I also like the fact that people, when they see it, will be like, "Sword of Waxing? It's like wax on, wax off? What? Right? That the fact that obviously it doesn't mean that, but what else could it mean? I like creating that little confusion because that gives me some space to put drama in. It's a unique thing to me. I think other people think I'm dumb. Um, so I'm not going to explain what I mean by that like I just did to you here in the text. I'm just going to leave it here. Uh, so there's stuff we're, there's definitely stuff we're missing. That, and you notice that I'm making, this is very much how I work. I, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, and then every once in a while I make a heading, and I'll come back to that, and then I go, oh, I, and I didn't bother writing treachery next. I was inspired to write about art. Uh, we definitely get to treachery. We probably get to travel. So I'm, this is not yet useful to us as players who want to play clerics. Uh, I just want to heal people, man. Where, where is the church of that? I don't know yet. Um... But certainly nobility would include the responsibility to the poor uh, and the sick. So let's put that in here. Um, let me just move this here. Portfolio, nobility, comma, responsibility to the poor and sick. Not the poor and suck. It's a whole different God. <laughs> uh, let's see. Like a virtuous saint who a life cleric could happily serve 
probably would be a cleric of uh, of nobility, a god of nobility, but do they... So one of the gods here, Veras, is a god of uh, youth, health... Oh, my goodness! You people in chat have probably been screaming this at me this whole time. There is definitely a god of love. Rioans love falling in love, being in love. They invented romantic love. They, lo they, they are crazy for this stuff. They love romantic tragedies. Tragedies. Uh, fate and fortune. Tragedies feature prominently in Riohan uh, plays and opera going back centuries. Fate can. I'm denying them their true love. I'm put that in here. Classic Johan trope. You have met Rinaldo. He is in my uh, second book. He has an outrageous accent. And uh, he's a Johan playwright. And he talks, he's, he always talks about. Um, so we have art. That's super important to them. Fortune. We're getting close to having a bunch of gods. We have a god of nobility. We're going to have a god of fortune. And maybe that's the king and queen. Uh, because they're related. And they're... Uh, I also like the idea that Riohans might have this um, kind of like I think their attitude towards sexuality is super liberal and so I think it might be a king and a queen and a man and a woman but sometimes fate is a man or a woman and so sometimes they're a pair they're both masculine uh, and that to Riohans is like you know whatever man the gods are complex don't tell them what to do um, that, 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 that kind of it's almost like two different layers of this one on top of the other I don't know yet. We'll, we'll get there. Definitely a god of treachery, uh, deceit, scheming, planning. Planning is um, is bad as far as Rowans are concerned. Um, the hate administration is one of the reasons I don't like guilds. And I don't know how to spell bureaucracy. Deceit. I spelled deceit like receipt. <laughs> um, deceit, scheming, planning. Riohans, let me make sure this is appropriately uh, headered. How do you know? How do you know how, how? This could mean anything. And forget, until we give it the proper header, it's just a word floating out there. It's not designed yet. It's not organized. Deceit, scheming, planning. Riohans hate planning. They hate administration, bureaucracy, and outlines. Uh, a writer is expected to sit down. This is crazy. This is where this is going is weird, but it'll work out. Trust me. Writer is expected to sit down and write until the play is over. Notice when I say a writer, implicitly playwright, and the play is over. Don't plan it out. Follow your muse. Discover the work. To see where it leads. People who plan over much. I've already introduced a little bit of ambiguity here. Right? I said it's planning is bad, and I said people plan over much. Why? Because that's how people work. This thing is bad, categorical. And then, well, you got to live with it. you got to have some in there. So, you know, there's a difference between... What's that thing? Honored more in the breach than the observance. Quote Henry V, I think. Honored more in the breach than the observance. Hamlet! That was close. Uh... Yeah, custom more a custom that we we refer to a lot because we're breaking it. <laughs> that's how we that's how we know about this. So people who plan over much are suspicious. Remember, it's our responsibility to not only consider what do these people hold virtuous, but what are the vices? What are the things they don't like? What are the things? What makes them suspicious? Right? Vaslorians would suspect somebody who was sick or weak. And they're like, what's wrong with that guy? Right? And that's where our other gods come from. That's where uh, service comes from. That notion of somebody who was born maimed would be like the gods have done me wrong. And I'm going to, right? So that's where these guys are like 
you know, just go for it, man. See what happens. Um, people who plan over much are suspicious. Uh, people, uh, yeah. Deceit, scheming, planning. Rayoans hate planning. They hate administration, bureaucracy, and outlines. A writer is expected to sit down and write until the play is over. Don't plan it out. Follow your muse. Discover your discover the work. See where it leads. People who plan over much are suspicious. Um, of course, the Assassin's Guild makes it, you know, So you might think of as assassins, the ruins might think of these assassins as being these romantic characters, but they would also have these qualities that Riohans, they have, they have affection for, but distasteful, right? So that notion that an, an assassination is not a, just a murder, a murder is a spontaneous act. Actually, Riohans quite like that uh, violence. Uh, and in fact, not just violence, but spontaneous. Well, hang on a minute. I don't want to write myself into a corner here because Riohans definitely like dueling, right? They like that, but I think it would be in the moment. They wouldn't. They would never. A Riohan, a Riohan would never like a, a a Riohan would never say pistols at dawn. They would say no, no pistols right now. <laughs> that notion. Let's not put it off. Yeah, spontaneous violence. Oh. is um i don't want to say virtuous but yeah it's, it's virtuous follow your heart don't think over much even the word over much i think is a real home term they use a lot uh so coming up on 7 30 been doing this for an hour and a half making what i would consider good progress um So I think things are going well. I think we're getting close to the end of this stream. I apologize if you're into it, but that means just more work next week. Uh, but I don't think there's um, that much work left to do. We're getting close to the idea of at least knowing who the gods are, or at least what they represent. Nobility, fate, and fortune. And maybe I have to dig into maybe just fortune. Fortune? Well, no, fate and fortune. I don't want people to think fortune meaning money. Gambling. Uh, if you can play. Deceit, scheming, planning, Riohans hate planning. They hate uh, administration and bureaucracy and outlines. A writer is expected to sit down and write until the play is over. Um, they also don't like people who, uh, well, hang on. Uh, an assassination must be planned. It is, <laughs> it is, it is a, Metaphorically, allegorically, Meta metaphorically, I think actually both of these things are highly romanticized, assassination, and, but uh, for different reasons. sword sir or by the gods or actually by this one person I will slay no I will scar a coward that's actually not bad draw your sword sir or by the gods I will scar a coward uh, 
I don't even know if that makes any literal sense. <laughs> uh, but it's evocative. So if I knew who that god was, they wouldn't say by the gods. They would say by this one person, right? Uh, so we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, I think we're almost done, actually, with the things I want to talk about. Um, love is definitely one of them. So let's... I, I'm not even sure about... Uh, uh, I, I definitely... I don't think wealth is one of them. Um, trade, no, we got... Uh, no, no, we want to... We, we don't want to raise up trade as a virtue because we want to hold the guilds. The guilds are this new thing. And people join guilds for prosperity and protection and stuff like that. Of pragmatic reasons, not not cultural reasons. They're aware that, like... People look at it as weird, but the guilds are, and, and there's a difference between Rioja, which is this long, thin place, uh, and Capital, which is a city there. The guilds are, are they're all of the guild headquarters, even though they're all, each of the guilds is everywhere in, in Rioja and beyond. They have influence outside of the um, nations where they were born. Their headquarters are all in Capital. So things are different in capital guild being a member of a guild is you know it's almost sort of expected now because again the guilds are ascendant but but it's not they wouldn't have gods to any of this stuff yet not, and not for hundreds of years probably so 729 we've been doing this so we'll come back and talk about what the Rioans think about art and for, I mean, again, this is going to be one of those things where it may seem, stuff ideally will come together at the end. It may seem as though we haven't talked a lot about gods, but I think, I think we have. I don't, I don't see a difference between what I'm doing right now and figuring out who the gods of real are. Because I have to figure out what the culture is, what are their mores and folkways, what are the things that they admire, and what are the things that they fear. Um, you know, I guess... Uh, Bravery, bravery is definitely, is, is that implicit? Would there be God of bravery? Let's make sure we talk about bravery and cowardice. Uh, I'm just going to make a note here because that's definitely something they, they don't want to be thought of as a coward. Uh, would there be a God of cowardice? No. But there might be a God of bravery. And would that be the same as the God of violence? Maybe. Probably. Yes. Did my computer just crash? Well, Microsoft Word's not happy. Microsoft Word's like, you said an hour and a half. So, uh, I don't know what just happened, but good job, Microsoft, uh, for, for not having everything go to hell. Uh, violence and bravery. So that was another thought process. Definitely, I, I'm like, they don't like cowardice. Um, I think that's something they share with probably a lot of cultures. But I think that it is uniquely motivating in Rioja. And so that's probably where a lot of this violence comes from. There's a close violence and bravery are close, close cousins to the Rioans. That's not true in Vasloria. In Vasloria, violence has more to do with like war, which they consider like they like, you know, uh, dukes are expected to be great generals in Vasloria. Duke Bade, if you read my novels, is like one of only two men that Hayden looks up to and would just obey unquestioningly um, because he's a great general. He's a great. That's what dukes are expected to do and be. Rioja doesn't have that idea. Um, so I think that's it. I'm going to uh, maybe edit a little bit of this and then I'll put it up on YouTube. And we'll continue. We'll uh, do this again next Saturday. And I'll put the docs up so that people can read them in the meantime and look at them. And uh, for the rest of the, or at least the next like 10 minutes or so, I'll probably edit this out of the video. I'll just see how chat's doing and talk to them. So until next Saturday, peace out.